The term extended techniques has been part of the vocabulary of contemporary composition for over 50 years now. But what exactly does it mean? In this video, we will look at the origins of the term and also what it might mean for a composer working today. Every composer throughout history has been confronted with changing means. New instruments, new harmonies, new ways of performing and composing music. The techniques and materials of music making have never stopped evolving, and usually they've reflected changing historical, social, and technological contexts. For instance, Beethoven explored the new possibilities of the piano in the late 18th century in works such as the Pathétique Sonata, which contained a wealth of sonic ideas, dynamic contrasts, huge registral shifts, and quasi-orchestral sonorities. He also required novel coloristic effects such as Sul Ponticello in his C-sharp minor string quartet, requiring the performers to move their bows closer to the bridge than they normally would for an eerie, glassy sound. Schumann wrote his famous Adagio and Allegro Opus 70 for the then brand new valved horn, and he made full use of its technical capabilities in a piece that is among his finest chamber works. The chromaticism of his language and his need for heightened expressive possibilities coincided perfectly with the development of this new instrument. But whenever a technological gain is made, it is important to observe simultaneously what is also being lost. So for instance, the development of woodwind instruments in the 19th century resulted in much more keywork, necessitating heavier woods, such as ebony and granadilla, which in turn affected the instrument's tone quality and made certain effects, such as glissandi and subtle pitch shifts, impossible or extremely difficult to execute. Equal temperament in keyboard instruments made it possible to play in every key, but it also robbed music of the peculiar characteristics that would occur when you would modulate to a distant key. This resulted in a lessening of pure intervals for the sake of a more homogeneous sound. It's always a matter of checks and balances. Moving forward to the first half of the 20th century, we begin to see really unconventional performance instructions in works such as Schoenberg's monodrama Erwartung, where he requires the harpist to place a piece of paper against the strings of their instrument, resulting in a buzzing sound. Another example from the very end of the same work is the alarming sound of the entire wind section playing rising, flutter-tongued lines. Schoenberg, then at the height of his expressionist phase, looked for coloristic effects that would heighten the already considerable expressivity of his music. In the Borletta of his sixth string quartet, Béla Bartók wrote quarter tones. In one section of the work, Bartók sought to go beyond conventional Western scales to evoke the microtonal sounds of Balkan folk music. Throughout the 20th century, composers explored highly individual languages, exploring every aspect of composition, harmony, rhythm, instrumentation, and of course, timbre. Composers like Charles Ives wrote pieces for quarter-tone pianos, while Henry Cowell wrote tone clusters. George Antile asked for airplane propellers and player pianos in his famous Ballet Mécanique. Anton Webern made use of just about every string technique imaginable that had been developed at the point where he was writing his quartet pieces, playing with the wood of the bow, playing close to the bridge or high up on the fingerboard, harmonic pizzicati, and so on. On the whole, though, these were mostly localized coloristic effects, not yet having a profound structural impact on composition itself. In that sense, they're not that different from Verdi's use of the anvil as a percussion instrument in his opera Il Trovatore, or Tchaikovsky's use of the celesta to illustrate the dance of the sugar plum fairy. But this was only the beginning. What we now think of as extended techniques are, to some extent, the expansion of this exploration of timbre in instrumental sonority. But there's a crucial difference. Whereas the cannons and anvils and airplane propellers and quarter-tone pianos expanded the expressive possibilities available to composers, they did little to alter the relationship between the performer and their instrument, let alone the nature of composition itself. This started to change after World War II, and especially in the late 1950s. The American composer John Cage probably went farther than virtually anybody else at this time in exploring new sounds and pushing boundaries, beginning with his prepared piano pieces, which required the pianist to insert little pieces of rubber or bolts or pieces of wood between the strings of the piano in order to alter its resonance and attack characteristics. Later works, such as the Concert for Piano and Orchestra of 1958, made an even more extensive foray into new instrumental sounds. In any case, this sort of practice was by no means widespread, and it attracted considerable controversy and hostility. Nevertheless, we start to see a chasm opening up between, on the one hand, conventional, traditional, conservatory-approved techniques and radical new ways of producing sound on musical instruments. I'm not exactly certain when the term extended techniques began to achieve wide currency, 
but I would guess it would have been sometime around the late 1960s when we started to see a concerted effort on the part of performers and composers to research and catalog these new sounds. The indisputed pioneer in this regard was certainly the Italian composer Bruno Bartolozzi, whose book New Sounds for Woodwinds appeared in 1969. The book listed things such as multiphonics, microtones, slap tongue, key clicks, color trills, and many other effects, complete with an entirely new range of notations, and a 7-inch vinyl disc to illustrate the sounds described in the book. This was no longer a matter of coloristic touches, but rather entire new categories of sound production. Instrumental technique, rather than merely reflecting the changing expressive needs of performers and composers, became an autonomous field of research in its own right, requiring recording studios, technicians, and sonograms. And following Bartolozzi's example, countless other volumes soon appeared, covering practically every imaginable instrument. Works such as Luciano Berrio's Sequenza No. 7 for solo oboe are emblematic of this period, in that it is practically a catalog of such possibilities, strung together like jewels in one dazzling, kaleidoscopic, and highly virtuosic composition. Perhaps coincidentally, this piece appeared in 1969, the same year that Bruno Bartolozzi's book appeared. In any case, like Varese before him, Berio understood that timbre was now a fully-fledged participant in the discourse of music, equal in every regard to pitch, rhythm, and intensity. And he did not shy away from asking performers to entirely relearn their technique in order to perform his compositions. So what exactly happened in the years following World War II? Well, fundamentally, the microphone forever altered our relationship to sound, much as photography had drastic consequences for painting and cinema for theater. With the widespread availability of recordings from the 1930s onwards, it became possible to isolate sounds and place them under a microscope, exploring the very inner life of sound. What had begun with a slow trickle in the late 19th century soon evolved into a vast open ocean of sonic possibilities. The pop music industry immediately seized upon any new technologies in order to make distinctive sounding and innovative new tracks. After all, one way to distinguish yourself in a crowded marketplace is to produce recordings that sound like no one else's. To give one example out of thousands, the song She Drives Me Crazy by the Fine Young Cannibals is probably remembered as much for sonic touches such as the peculiar gated snare sound that it introduced as for anything to do with the lyrics or the chord changes. Once the Bartolozzi books appeared, things began to change fundamentally for legions of composers. Now we had a rigorous catalogue of possibilities, complete with new notational symbols. These have now been thoroughly explored, catalogued, and exploited in thousands of pieces over the past 60 years or so, and they are now an increasingly standardized array of techniques familiar to countless performers. But their pre-packaged nature has come with a cost. Extended techniques are now an amazing bag of tricks that you can acquire with almost no effort, like a zip file containing thousands of illegally downloaded fonts. You don't really need most of them, but there they are, free for the taking. Page after page after page of them, ready to be inserted into whatever you're working on. It's all too easy to get lost in the woods, trying out countless sounds and techniques. Finding a path through these by now nearly limitless possibilities is one of the greatest challenges facing young composers today. Add to that the possibilities offered by Pro Tools, real-time signal processing, and applications like Open Music, and the possibilities are truly dizzying. Composers such as Kaya Sarayahu, Heinz Holliger, and Rebecca Saunders have made explorations into the frontiers of instrumental technique an important part of their work, with brilliant inventiveness and creativity. Probably the emblematic figurehead of this approach is the German composer Helmut Lachenmann. Lachenmann needed to develop a new approach in his work, not because he was seeking novelty for its own sake, but because he had a powerful, expressive, and philosophical project in his music that required new means. Somewhere along the line, the search for new sounds for many composers became an end unto itself, and their absence could be taken as a sign of backwardness, a lack of imagination, or naivety. But 50 years after Bruno Bartolozzi's book first appeared, it's hard to maintain that sounds that are now well over half a century old are still somehow experimental. The floodgates of sound have been opened, and there's no going back. Whether a sound is being heard for the first time or for the 10,000th time, what really matters is whether or not the composer has succeeded in creating a vital and powerful piece of music, enriching human culture with new worlds of sensation, thought, and feeling. If you like this channel, support it. Your help allows me to keep on making high-quality music education videos available to anyone around the world who wants to watch them at any time for free. Check out the rewards for varying levels of support at www.patreon.com/samuelandreev. Thanks for watching.